Hey, Broccoli fam, big announcement. I have started a new audio-only channel for those of you who enjoy listening to horror stories. Do check it out. I'm sure you would love it. Putting the link in the description box. Love you all. I worked at the same insurance company for five years. It wasn't a perfect job, but I didn't have any problems. I liked my coworkers, and I never had to take my work home with me. Unfortunately, everything changed about a month ago when our supervisor retired. He hired his nephew, Mark, as a replacement, and Mark was absolutely terrible. He was in his early 20s and had no idea what he was doing. He tried to make all these changes that just caused more work and more confusion for me and my coworkers. He introduced a new online platform that we had to use, meaning we basically had to enter all the information twice. A task that should have taken 15 minutes to complete ended up taking over an hour. And slowly, I started working overtime without getting paid for it. Normally, I took the files home with me and did the extra work on my home computer. But last weekend, the electricity at my house went out and I had to go back to the office to finish everything before Monday. It was about 10 at night and the whole building was completely empty. We should have had a security guard outside the building, but I didn't see him when I walked in. I sat at my desk and started finishing off my work. I thought it would take me an hour, but I ended up staying there until about midnight before I finally finished everything. Printed out all the copies I needed and was putting them back in their folders when I heard the door open. Because I was going through the drawers, I was crouched on the ground and didn't see who had entered. I peered over my cubicle wall and saw Mark walking with a woman. He had his arms around her shoulder and they were talking and laughing. The woman wore an extremely short red dress and had thick, trashy makeup. She looked, well, you know. I was so shocked and embarrassed to see the two of them together that I stayed crouched on the ground so that they wouldn't see me. I figured it would be best if I stayed hidden until they went into his office. I knew that I had just found out Mark's secret and could use this information to my advantage, but I wasn't that kind of person. Even if Mark made my life miserable, I would never blackmail him over it. I stayed there for about five minutes as Mark led this woman through the office and gave her a tour of the place. The way he talked to her made it seem like he was some big shot instead of the manager of a tiny insurance company. All the woman said were things like, wow, that's incredible. Then I heard a door close and their voices faded away. He had taken her into his office. This was my opportunity to sneak out of there before he saw me. Crouching low to the ground, I crept back toward the exit. I had to walk past his office door on my way, which meant that I heard their voices on the other side of the wall. I reached for the handle to the front door and tried to open it without making a sound when I heard a scream coming from Mark's office. It was a scream of pain. I froze in place, my hands still on the doorknob, as I heard Mark angrily shout, Shut up! Then there was a loud thud, and the woman's screaming stopped. After that, there was only silence. I couldn't see what happened, thank God, but it definitely sounded like Mark had gotten violent with that woman. It sounded like he had killed her. Mark's office door slowly creaked open. I realized that he didn't have enough time to get out of the building without Mark seeing me. So I flattened myself onto the floor and crawled behind one of the cubicles. I peered around the edge of the cubicle as Mark walked backward, out of his office, dragging the woman's body toward the exit. She was definitely dead. As he dragged her, he kept muttering under his voice, it was an accident, he said. It's not my fault. 
I held my breath so that he wouldn't hear me. Mark slowly opened the front door and started dragging that poor woman into the lobby. Once they were gone, I was finally able to breathe again. I gasped in air, but it was too soon because Mark instantly ran back inside and shouted, Who's there? He knew that I was hiding somewhere. I could hear his footsteps pounding through the office, looking around each of the cubicles. It was only a matter of time before he found me. I had to act fast. Just as he walked toward my hiding place, I jumped up and shoved the water cooler onto its side. Water splashed everywhere. It didn't hurt Mark, but it distracted him long enough for me to run past him and out the door. I had to step over that woman's body before I reached the front of the building. My hand shaking, I pulled my ID card out of my pocket. I needed to scan it before the door would open. Mark ran toward me, not saying a word. He grabbed me just as I got the doors to open. I twisted out of his grip and raced into the parking lot. I knew he'd catch me before I could get inside my car, so I ran right past it. I had to get to the main road. Even in the middle of the night, there were always cars on the road. Mark would never be able to stop me with so many witnesses driving by. I skidded to a stop when I reached the sidewalk. With a huge stroke of luck, a police car was driving by at that exact moment. I waved my arms in the air to get its attention, and the car made a U-turn and came back for me. I looked over my shoulder, but Mark was no longer there. He had given up on the chase. I told the policeman that I just witnessed a murder. He called in backup and then followed me back toward the office. When we went back inside, Mark was, went upstairs to investigate. The office was dimly lit and the quiet hum of the computers filled the air. As I approached the second floor, I heard faint whispers coming from one of the offices. It was strange. Everyone was supposed to be away on the team building retreat. I cautiously made my way towards the source of the sound. The door to the office was slightly ajar, and I could see the glow of a computer screen inside. My heart raced as I pushed the door open and saw someone hunched over the keyboard. It was Mark. He was supposed to be on the run, but here he was, in our office. I quickly retreated and hid behind a row of filing cabinets, trying to make sense of the situation. Mark seemed engrossed in whatever he was doing on the computer. I took out my phone and dialed the police, whispering my location and the presence of the fugitive in our office. While on the call, I heard Mark muttering to himself, he was talking about some plan, mentioning revenge and escape. I couldn't catch all the details, but it sent shivers down my spine. As I continued to relay information to the police, Mark suddenly stood up and looked around as if he sensed something. I held my breath, praying he wouldn't discover my hiding spot. Mark paced around the office, searching for the source of the disturbance. My heart pounded in my chest as he came closer to my hiding place, just when it seemed like he might discover me. The police sirens echoed outside the building, distracting him. Seizing the opportunity, I bolted from my hiding spot and rushed down the stairs to meet the arriving police officers. They apprehended Mark without much resistance. The building was once again filled with the sound of sirens and police activity. Later, the police discovered that Mark had been using the office computers to manipulate financial records, attempting to cover his tracks and disappear with the stolen money. It turned out the murder was not an isolated incident, but part of a larger scheme. As the investigation unfolded, I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that I narrowly escaped a dangerous encounter with Mark. The incident left me shaken, and the once familiar office environment now carried a haunting presence. 
Little did I know, this was just the beginning of a series of events that would unravel in the following weeks. Ran over to my computer and clicked on the message box at the bottom of the screen. It said the message was sent from Stan, my boss, but it couldn't be him because he was off in the mountains. At least I knew which computer it was sent from. The message said, get out of the building. Chills ran down my spine. Who would send something like this? I typed in my reply. Who are you? A response came immediately. A friend. I wrote back. Why do you want me to get out of the building? It took a little longer for a response to come in this time. It said in all caps, get out now. That response told me everything. Someone was upstairs doing something illegal, probably stealing money or documents. They came here today because they knew everyone would be gone from the office. Whoever this person was, they must have realized that I was still here and used the messages to get me to leave. I had worked for this company for two years, and even though I mostly stuck to myself, I had always been proud of the work I'd done. I felt loyal to the company and didn't want this crook to get away with whatever he was doing. So, against my own common sense, I decided to walk upstairs and confront him myself. As soon as I reached the second floor, I started to have second thoughts. I should have contacted the police before I came up here, but it was too late now. I had to be quiet until I reached Stan's office door. All the windows were drawn, and the lights were out, but I could see the blue glow from Stan's computer. I walked toward the door, expecting to hear someone rifling through papers on the other side, but I didn't. Everything was deathly quiet. I took a deep breath and then pushed the door open. I don't know what I expected to see, but I definitely didn't expect an empty office. No one was in here and the blue glow from the computer was. Because of its screensaver, I double-checked that the room was empty, and then I, shocked and grief-stricken, I couldn't believe what I was seeing and hearing. Stan, my boss, had orchestrated the explosion, and he had used my name as collateral damage. I was supposed to be inside the building when it happened. I immediately went to the police with the evidence I had gathered from Stan's computer. The authorities were able to trace the messages and uncover the sinister plot. Stan and his business partner, Steve, had planned the explosion to cover up some illicit activities, and my name was mentioned to divert any suspicions. The news of Stan's betrayal and the planned explosion shocked everyone in the company. Police arrested both Stan and Steve, and the truth came out during their trial. They were involved in a complex scheme of embezzlement and fraud, and the explosion was meant to destroy any evidence that could expose them. The company, now under new management, cooperated with the investigation, and I became a key witness in the case. It was a challenging time, but justice prevailed. Stan and Steve were convicted of their crimes, and the company worked hard to rebuild itself. I found solace in the support of my colleagues and friends during those difficult days. The trauma of the event lingered, but I eventually returned to work, now with a renewed sense of purpose. The experience taught me the importance of staying vigilant and trusting my instincts. Life moved on and the company slowly recovered from the shock. I, too, began to rebuild my career and personal life. The incident remained a haunting memory, a reminder of the darkness that could lurk beneath the surface, even in a seemingly ordinary workplace. In control of my life, the conversation didn't go well. She got angry and called me selfish for going on a vacation without my brother, but I stood my ground and left the next day. The Mountain Spa Resort was a peaceful haven, 
surrounded by serene landscapes and a calming atmosphere. I enjoyed my time there, disconnected from the usual birthday chaos. The spa treatments, scenic hikes, and moments of solitude brought a much needed sense of tranquility. On the evening of my birthday, I treated myself to a quiet dinner at the resort's restaurant. As I sipped my tea and enjoyed the view, a waiter approached with a small, elegantly wrapped box. He explained that it was a gift from another guest who wished to remain anonymous. Intrigued, I opened the box to find a beautiful necklace with a note that simply read, for the one who deserves to be celebrated. I was touched by the unexpected gesture. It was a reminder that, even if my family dynamics made me feel insignificant, there were kind strangers who recognized my worth. The necklace became a symbol of my decision to prioritize my own happiness and celebrate myself. Independent of the overshadowing presence of my brother, when I returned home, my mom's disapproval lingered but I felt a newfound strength. I realized that it was okay to prioritize my own well-being and celebrate myself on my terms. The anonymous gift served as a poignant reminder that there are individuals who understand the importance of acknowledging others, even when the circumstances are challenging. From that birthday onward, I embraced the idea of self-celebration while family dynamics may not change, I found joy in creating my own traditions and making my birthday a celebration of my individuality. The necklace, a symbol of that transformative moment, continued to hold a special place in my heart. As he held the door open for me, he introduced himself as Alex, and we headed to the hotel's restaurant together. The conversation flowed effortlessly filled with laughter and shared stories. I learned that Alex was also taking a solo vacation, seeking a break from his hectic work life. Over dinner, we discovered common interests and exchanged tales of our mountain adventures. As we parted ways that evening, he suggested we meet up for the spa day on Saturday, sensing that I might enjoy some company. I agreed feeling a surprising sense of connection and comfort with this stranger. The following day, Saturday, was filled with luxurious spa treatments, relaxation, and the shared enjoyment of the stunning mountain scenery. Alex and I continued to bond, our connection deepening with each passing moment. I found myself grateful for the unexpected companionship on what had initially been planned as a solo retreat. On Sunday, as we took a leisurely hike together, the breathtaking views mirrored the beauty of our budding connection. We exchanged contact information, promising to keep in touch after our time at the resort came to an end. Returning to the city, I felt rejuvenated, not just from the spa treatments, but also from the unexpected friendship that had blossomed during my birthday getaway. It was a reminder that sometimes the most meaningful moments happen when we least expect them. Months passed, and Alex and I maintained our connection. What began as a chance encounter at a mountain resort transformed into a genuine friendship. We shared stories, offered support, and celebrated life's victories, creating a bond that extended beyond the picturesque mountains. Looking back, that birthday retreat turned out to be more than just a solo vacation. It became a turning point, a reminder that life's surprises can lead to unexpected joy and connections. The necklace I received on a previous birthday, symbolizing self-celebration, took on a new layer of significance as it now represented the unexpected friendships that can enrich our lives when we open ourselves to the possibilities around us. 
plans with my family that evening and couldn't cancel on them last minute. I explained the situation to Adam, and he completely understood, suggesting that we could plan something for another time. I reluctantly agreed, feeling a bit disappointed that our time together was coming to an end. We exchanged a warm farewell, and as I left the resort, I couldn't help but reflect on the incredible birthday weekend I had experienced. When I arrived home, the family drama resumed, but this time, I faced it with a newfound strength. The memories of my solo birthday retreat and the unexpected connection with Adam lingered in my mind, providing a sense of peace amid the chaos. Over the following weeks, Adam and I stayed in touch. We shared photographs, stories, and continued to discover the commonalities that had initially drawn us together. Despite the geographical distance, our connection grew stronger, evolving into a deep and meaningful friendship. As time went on, I realized that my birthday celebration had become a pivotal moment in my life. It was the moment I embraced the idea of self-celebration, allowing myself to prioritize my happiness and well-being. The necklace, a symbol of that decision, became a cherished reminder of the strength I found within myself. Though Adam and I lived in different cities, our friendship endured. We visited each other when our schedules allowed, exploring new places and creating more memories together. What started as a chance encounter during a birthday retreat turned into a lasting connection that brought joy and positivity into my life. As the years passed, I continued to celebrate my birthday in my own way, surrounded by the people and experiences that brought genuine happiness. The solo birthday retreat had set a precedent, reminding me that I deserved to be celebrated, not just on that special day, but every day. Felt a chill run down my spine as I realized the gravity of the situation. Adam, the seemingly friendly and charming man I had met during my birthday retreat, had been following me and gathering information about my life. The items in his backpack raised alarm bells, and the pictures of me felt like an invasion of my privacy. Terrified, I carefully put everything back in the backpack, trying not to give away my shock. I needed to act calmly and find a way to distance myself from Adam without causing any suspicion. When Adam returned, he seemed oblivious to the internal turmoil I was experiencing. We continued the hike, but I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched and analyzed. I decided to cut our time short, citing fatigue and the need to prepare for my family dinner. As we reached the base of the trail, Adam suggested we exchange numbers to plan the dinner in the city. I hesitated, but reluctantly gave him my number, all the while thinking of ways to protect myself from this unsettling situation. Once we parted ways, I rushed back to the hotel, my mind racing. I needed to inform someone about what I had discovered. I contacted a friend, explaining the situation and sending her the pictures from Adam's backpack. She urged me to report it to the authorities immediately. After notifying the hotel staff about the suspicious behavior of a guest, I reached out to the local authorities, providing them with all the information I had. They assured me they would investigate the matter thoroughly. The next few days were nerve-wracking as I cooperated with the police investigation. They discovered that Adam had a history of stalking and had targeted multiple individuals in the past. My decision to trust my instincts and report the situation had potentially saved me from a dangerous encounter. Adam was apprehended, and I obtained a restraining order to ensure my safety. The experience left me shaken, but also empowered. It reinforced the importance of staying vigilant, trusting my instincts, and taking action 
when faced with potential threats. As I resumed my daily life, I reflected on the events that unfolded during what was supposed to be a birthday retreat. It was a stark reminder that sometimes, even in serene settings, danger could lurk. The necklace, a symbol of self-celebration, now carried an added layer of significance, a reminder of resilience and the strength to protect oneself from unforeseen threats. Moment we arrived, the atmosphere felt different. The air was thick with an inexplicable tension, and the usual sounds of nature seemed to hush as if in anticipation. I brushed off my unease, attributing it to the unfamiliar surroundings. As night fell, we gathered around a bonfire, sharing stories and laughter. The cabin's interior was cozy, but an underlying chill lingered in the air. One of my friends, Sarah, mentioned feeling a strange sensation as if someone was watching her. We dismissed it as mere imagination, not wanting to let any unease spoil our weekend. That night, as we settled into our respective rooms, I couldn't shake the feeling of being observed. The creaking of the cabin and the distant rustling of leaves played tricks on my mind. I chalked it up to the isolated location and tried to calm my nerves, assuring myself that it was all in my head. The following morning, we decided to explore the nearby trails. The beauty of the surroundings momentarily distracted me from the lingering discomfort. However, as we ventured deeper into the woods, a peculiar sensation intensified. It was as if an invisible presence accompanied us leaving an unsettling energy in its wake. During our hike, we stumbled upon an old cemetery hidden among the trees. The gravestones were weathered and worn, bearing names that had long been forgotten. The air around the cemetery felt heavy, and an inexplicable sadness hung in the atmosphere. We quickly left, eager to escape the eerie ambience. Back at the cabin, Strange occurrences continued. Objects seemed to move on their own, and whispers echoed through the rooms when no one spoke. Sarah, increasingly disturbed, insisted that there was something unnatural in the cabin. The once joyful atmosphere now felt oppressive. That night, as we gathered around the bonfire once more, shadows danced eerily across the trees. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone. A sudden drop in temperature sent shivers down our spines, and we exchanged uneasy glances. In an attempt to dispel the tension, we decided to play a light-hearted game. However, the flickering lights and the distant howls of wind created an eerie backdrop. The game took an unexpected turn when the air became charged with a palpable energy and the room seemed to vibrate with an otherworldly force. In that moment, the skeptical barrier I had built against the supernatural began to crumble. The weekend getaway, intended for relaxation, had become a haunting experience, challenging my beliefs and leaving an indelible mark on my understanding of the unexplained. The shadows cast by the bonfire seemed to dance with unseen entities, and the woods whispered secrets that eluded the grasp of reason. As the night wore on, we couldn't escape the feeling that the cabin held secrets of its own. Secrets that transcended the tangible and ventured into the realm of the supernatural. The weekend getaway became a journey into the unknown, an encounter with forces beyond our comprehension, forever altering the way I perceived the thin veil between the living and the unseen. Energy, a chill ran down my spine as I stood there, paralyzed with fear. The woman in the white gown didn't say a word. Instead, 
she began to glide towards me, her movements unnaturally smooth. Panic set in, and I stumbled backward, desperate to escape the apparition that seemed to defy the laws of the living. I rushed back to the room where my friends were sleeping, waking them with urgency. As I explained what I had witnessed, they initially dismissed it as a nightmare or a product of my imagination. However, the fear in my eyes convinced them to investigate. Reluctantly, we all tiptoed back to the kitchen, hoping to find it empty and prove that my encounter was nothing more than a vivid dream. To our horror, the woman in the white gown was still there, now standing near the entrance of the kitchen. A collective gasp escaped our lips as we watched her, unable to comprehend the surreal sight before us. Karen, the seemingly kind host, was nowhere to be found, and in her place stood this ghostly figure with haunting eyes. Unable to stay in the cabin any longer, we gathered our belongings and fled into the night. The once welcoming retreat had transformed into a nightmare, and the specter of the woman in the white gown lingered in our minds. We reported the eerie encounter to the local authorities, who, to our surprise, revealed that Karen, the host, had passed away in the cabin years ago. Her spirit, it seemed, continued to reside in the place she once called home. Haunted by the experience, we struggled to make sense of the supernatural events that unfolded during our weekend getaway. The cabin, initially a refuge from our busy lives, had become a conduit for the supernatural, challenging our understanding of life and death. As we left the cabin behind, we couldn't shake the feeling that Karen's presence, or perhaps her spirit, had played a role in our unsettling encounter. The memories of the woman in the white gown and the inexplicable events within those walls remained etched in our minds, forever altering our perception of the seemingly serene and idyllic retreat we had sought. Back until we were a safe distance away, the once serene and picturesque retreat had become a place of malevolent forces and unexplained horrors. Determined to uncover the truth, we decided to research the history of the cabin and the surrounding area. As we delved into local archives and historical records, we discovered the tragic tale that Karen had hinted at. Many years ago, a family had indeed met a gruesome end in the woods where the cabin now stood. The details were chilling, and the spirits of the murdered family were said to still linger, seeking justice or revenge. The cursed land had claimed the lives of those who dared to inhabit it, and the cabin became a vessel for the supernatural. Haunted by the memory of Karen's unconscious form in that eerie room, we reached out to paranormal investigators and experts in the supernatural. They confirmed the presence of malevolent entities in the cabin. Their energies intertwined with the tragic history of the land. In an attempt to cleanse the cabin and provide peace to the lingering spirits, we consulted with a spiritual healer who specialized in removing negative energies. The process was intense, involving rituals and ceremonies to purify the space and release the trapped souls. As the rituals unfolded, we felt the oppressive atmosphere slowly lift, and the unsettling occurrences ceased. It seemed that the spirits had finally found a semblance of peace, and the cursed cabin became dormant once more. The experience left us shaken and changed, with a newfound respect for the mysteries that lurked in the unseen realms. The idyllic retreat we had sought had transformed into a journey of survival and discovery, unraveling the dark secrets hidden within the haunted confines of the cabin. 
In the end, we made peace with the fact that some places carry a history that transcends the visible world, and not all getaways offer the serenity they promise. The cursed cabin became a cautionary tale, a reminder that sometimes the pursuit of relaxation can lead us into the heart of the supernatural, where the past and present collide in ways beyond our understanding, revelation that left us horrified and disturbed. The seemingly warm and welcoming host who had greeted us with homemade cookies was, in reality, part of a dark and malevolent cult. The police delved deeper into the cult's activities, discovering a history of rituals and sacrifices that spanned many years. Karen had played a role in their sinister plans, using the cabin as a trap for unsuspecting guests who sought a peaceful getaway. The symbols etched into the walls and floors were markers of the cult's presence, a haunting reminder of the evil that lurked in the shadows. As the investigation unfolded, the cult members were identified, and a crackdown on their activities began. The authorities worked tirelessly to dismantle the cult, ensuring that they would no longer pose a threat to anyone seeking refuge in the cabin or its vicinity. The revelation left us with a sense of betrayal and disbelief. The idyllic retreat we had envisioned had turned into a nightmare, and the trust we had placed in our host had been shattered. It became a cautionary tale, a stark reminder that danger could lurk in the most unsuspecting places. In the aftermath, we struggled to reconcile the serene beauty of the cabin with the darkness that had tainted its walls. The memories of strange occurrences, ghostly figures, and the unsettling presence of Karen haunted us. The experience left an indelible mark on our minds, forever changing our perspective on the supernatural and the hidden dangers that could lie beneath the surface of seemingly tranquil environments. The police continued their efforts to bring all the cult members to justice, ensuring that they would face the consequences of their heinous actions. Our role in reporting the events that transpired in that cursed cabin became a crucial part of dismantling the cult and preventing further harm. As we reflected on the surreal events that unfolded during what was meant to be a simple weekend getaway, we realized the importance of trusting our instincts and staying vigilant. The dark secrets that had come to light served as a stark reminder that sometimes the most serene landscapes can conceal the deepest and often malevolent mysteries. I understand the deep impact that such a traumatic experience can have on one's mental well-being. It's completely normal to feel haunted by the memories and to approach similar situations with caution. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is a serious and valid response to distressing events, and seeking support is crucial for your healing process. If you find that the PTSD symptoms persist and significantly affect your daily life, it's essential to consider professional help. Mental health professionals, such as therapists or counselors, specialize in supporting individuals who have experienced trauma. They can provide you with coping mechanisms, strategies to manage anxiety, and a safe space to process your emotions. Additionally, reaching out to friends and loved ones for support can be a crucial part of your recovery. Sharing your feelings and experiences with those you trust can help alleviate the burden and foster a sense of understanding. Remember that healing is a gradual process, 
and it's okay to seek assistance on your journey. Your well-being is important, and there are resources available to help you navigate the aftermath of such a harrowing experience.